question. Oh, I see a lot of attendees. Good morning, everybody. Pent up demand. That's great. We're happy to be back here in the, the virtual space. It's, it's, and no free coffee. No free coffee and <laughs> I'm downgraded to tea. I know, I feel bad for you, Brianna. And we've got hands. I see Ken's already got his hands up. So I see that we have about 12 people and more filtering in. Um, just going to say a couple of logistics before we kind of get into the conversation. Um, so as some of you might remember, you are um, invited to come in and ask your questions live. You can raise your hand as Ken and some others have already done. Um, or you could use the Q&A function and pop your question into the Q&A to be read to um, the group. All right. So before we get started in our conversation, I want to invite Paul and Sean if they have any general updates town information, things you want people to know before we kind of launch. Sure, because people have their hands up and we want to get to what they want to talk about first. But I do want to mention um, yesterday was the first time we had people at Hickory Ridge. We have a uh, interactive tour uh, information session going on at Hickory Ridge yesterday. We had, I think, over 50 people there. Uh, today, it's at 3.30 to 5, and you can come at 3.30 to hear the sort of information session or just come anytime, and there's people there to help guide you through. And then tomorrow, Saturday at 10.30. Um, it's beautiful. You get to walk around the, the, the land. Brianna was Brianna's helped organize it. Do you want to say add anything to that, Bree? Yeah, absolutely. So we're welcoming people on the site. You can give us your feedback, ask your questions. Um, if you're not able to make it, we do have a page on our engagement website, Engage Amherst slash Hickory, where we've already got almost 50 ideas and different upvotes and comments generated from the community. So feel free to put your idea there if you can't join us uh, today or tomorrow. And we also, along that vein, we have our American Rescue Plan Act funding engagement opportunities coming up, uh, virtual workshops, as well as a place for you to ask questions. And soon coming online will be a survey, and that is engageamherst.org slash A-R-P-A. Brianna, can I add, put one more shout out for um, the, the resident capital request window is open, and it's posted on the website. It's on the uh, Joint Capital Planning Committee page. Um, that window is open until around mid-November, um, and every year we get uh, several requests from the public um, that the town manager will then consider for his capital plan. So um, that request window is open for anybody um, who wants to submit one. And if you have any questions, you can um, contact me or, or Sonia Aldrich, and we can walk you through it. Great. Thank you, Sean. So as Paul mentioned, we do have a couple hands already, and I think we can maybe start there. Um, we, we did brand this conversation as discussing the um, capital projects in Amherst, especially the library and how that fits into the equation, but we obviously will take any questions on any topic. So um, Ken is the first hand. So Ken, if you would wanna unmute and introduce yourself, please. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Ken Rosenthal. I live on Sunset Avenue. I have, uh, at the start, I have a very short one and then a little longer. The short one is Rihanna on the website where we talk about a, a voting coming up in the election and how to vote. We say that we can vote by mail, but it doesn't say how to request your ballot if you want to vote by mail. So I need to know whether I can request my ballot by writing online or calling in by telephone or whether I have to come into the town hall and do it. So if you could just fix that so you would tell people like me how to request a ballot, that would help. That's the little one. The bigger one is, um, we're celebrating a couple of wonderful anniversaries mm. this fall. Um, we wouldn't be here except for the two colleges and the university, I think. We're all here because of them. And this is the 200th anniversary of Amherst College. And this weekend, in person, close to 700 people are coming to Hampshire College to celebrate its 50th anniversary, 50 plus one, in admitting students. And it's not just these institutions that we celebrate, but we should celebrate the town's role and bringing them here. A town very self-consciously welcomed and helped these places to establish themselves. I know from the history of Amherst College, and I know it personally because I worked with the town at Hampshire College, especially the town manager then, Alan Torrey, in, uh, in helping the college to exist. And it was really very, very cooperative. So my question is, and then I'll leave it to you, is the town doing anything as a town to celebrate these great anniversaries? 
because I think it's important for the townspeople to know how proud all the townspeople should be of Amherst and for the visitors to know how pleased the town is that these institutions are here and celebrating their great anniversaries. Thank you for taking my question. So th those are great um, comments, uh, Ken. So, I, you know, I believe the, the council will be looking at that. They have, we have not at this point. Um, you know, I just want to correct the Hampshire, re and obviously as an alum, I will be going to Hampshire's reunion, but it's a um, next weekend. I'm not sure we, sometimes when people say this weekend, it's the 15th to 17th. Um, so it's a really, of course. yeah. So it's a really exciting that they're able to do it in, in person. Um, so yes, yeah, so I think you, you raise a really good point because we do see ourselves in partnership um, with the colleges um, and the university. Um, and, you know, we, we should, the town should do a little bit more than what we've done so far. So it's a great idea. So. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Okay, I do see that Phyllis has a hand. So Phyllis, if you could unmute and introduce yourself. Phyllis Lara, I always follow Ken, so I have to keep the <laughs> tradition. Uh, you you co-opted me. I was going to really encourage people to uh, talk about Hickory Ridge and their ideas and go to the voter engagement. And I was also going to suggest the anniversary of Hampshire College next weekend because of you and Paul. One thing the town council has done in prior years is to pass some kind of resolution. So at a minimum, I think that should be done, you know, to honor uh, both the Amherst College, the 200th and Hampshire's uh, major anniversary. So that's really a big deal for our town to have these major institutions here that luckily Hampshire is surviving. I'm glad to hear that. And then the third thing, again, the election, Ken mentioned the, uh, the ballots, but the League of Women Voters, of which I am a member, is having all these candidate forums. There was one last night for the uh, councillors at large. They're going to be district councillors. There's going to be a school committee next Thursday. And on the 21st, there's going to be the Oliver Smith Will elector in the Housing Authority. So I hope people can join those at Zoom and don't forget to vote. And thank you for letting me say all this. <laughs> thank you, Phyllis. It was nice to see you yesterday. Um, Phyllis mentioned the candidates forums. They are on our community calendar on our website, but you can also find them at the League of Women Voters site, lwva.org. I just want to follow up. Um, so unbeknownst to me, uh, our council president is here and she's already working on the proclamation. She's been working on the proclamations, Ken, for both the colleges. So, um, so those are in the works and she will be the sponsor of them. So. Th Okay, so I do see another hand and we do have some pre-submitted questions that um, we received earlier. So I am going to ask Thomas to unmute and introduce. Uh, good morning, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Super, uh, Thomas Johnson, I live on Southeast Street. Um, we, the main topic this morning is, is sort of capital projects like the library. Um, but I would like to talk a little bit and ask you a question about the related issue of budgeting for operations and maintenance. Mm -hmm. um, we all know that capital projects, be it for land, for conservation, uh, facilities like the library, often involve some type of donation, which makes it more attractive and the fiscal burden on, on the town less. But we can't say the same for O&M expenses. And I have noticed that, um, you know, many of the trails in, in the wonderful uh, network in, in Amherst um, suffer from lack of maintenance. Uh, I live at the foot of Mount Pollux and, and see it there. In the case of the library, uh, I read on the website that if, if I remember correctly, between 11 and $13 million of the overall cost is attributable to what was referred to as deferred maintenance. So my question is, as we go to the ballot box on November 2nd and are asked or, or decide whether to make this large investment in the library, how can we feel assured 
that the Board of Trustees of the library and the town are taking into account <clears throat> the O&M expenses over the coming decades for the library so that we don't find ourselves in a position 25 years from now where <clears throat> maintenance has been deferred and the investment we make today, it has been, well, you know, has been diminished, has not been made as sustainable as it should be. Thank you. You wanna start with that, Sean? Sure. Um, so I think a couple of things um, that I would say on that. One, one is that in the past, we haven't invested in capital the way that we should have invested in capital, uh, the percentage of the budget that we put towards capital projects, which includes some um, some levels of maintenance, depending on the, the size, um, was a much lower percentage than where we're striving now. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why we're trying to get to 10% of our um, tax levy for capital so that we can do these capital projects and have funding available to do the maintenance and repair projects that we need to do. I think the other thing that we need to do with these four building projects is have really robust maintenance plans from the beginning and stick to them. Um, we've talked about setting aside reserves for maintenance uh, for the future, but having a really well done maintenance plan that we work on with the designer um, from the beginning for all these new buildings and that we stick to it is the way we wanna proceed. Yeah, I just, I just yeah. go, go ahead, Mr. Johnson. No, I'd like to hear your comment and then I'd like to respond to Sean. Sure. Um, so yeah, so for, for years, we've been um, under investing in our capital, we haven't had new buildings built for four decades. Typically, a, a town like this, we would be looking at a, a building a decade type type of replacement model. Um, and we haven't done the investment. But over the last five, six years, we've been building up, taking more and more of our operating budget and devoting it to capital, which includes maintenance. Um, and so that's an important piece of what we've been trying to do as a as a town um and the you know i think the um large different maintenance number for the um for the library is that it's not just maintenance it's when you when you start um making major changes to a building you start to trigger a lot of ada requirements and then that triggers additional expenses so those are additional things that come into play when you're doing major overhauls of buildings right Okay, so if I'm understanding you, um, the way the town budgets is that, you know, major maintenance, let's say uh, roof repairs or whatever, would come out of the capital budget as opposed to um, kind of recurrent? Yeah, I mean, so, you have a budget set aside for, for maintenance right. of, of so if the it's town a, hall or whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If it's a level of maintenance project that you would qualify as... Um, sort of a, a capital repair. So anything major, maybe over $10,000, that would likely come out of um, the capital plan. If it's something under, uh, you know, if it's just, if it's, whether it's be staffing, um, you know, having people available to go and fix things as they break, um, if it's lower levels of types of maintenance, then we have maintenance budgets within the operating budget. Okay. Well, I, I would just like to say a conclusion that, that I think it's useful if the town, uh, when it presents major new investments like the library, like Hickory Ridge, really is upfront with residents about, okay, you know, here's what the upfront costs are mm -hmm. and here are what the downstream costs are. And if, if that means because we're improving the quality of life, uh, we're, pro we're improving the quality of educational facilities and so on, that you know, the town and its residents need to look at, 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 at higher taxes. Um, so be it, you know, that's, that's part of the responsibility of, of governing and living. And if, and if we all want to improve these things, we need to realize the costs of, you know, go on for some time. So thank you. Excellent point. Thank you, Thomas. So I just want to remind we have some new people who have joined. You can feel free to raise your hand if you want to ask a question live or you can use the Q&A function. I do have a couple of questions that were sent to me previously that I am going to share with the group. Um, but feel free to raise your hands or put a new question into the, the chat box there. So um, I've got a number of questions here that were sent in and um, I'll kind of group these two together. 
they're they're asking if there's any truth to the rumor that the library expansion will lead to the closure of branch libraries one and if there's any truth to the fact that new technology at the library will lead to staff layoffs so we just want to address potential closure of branch libraries and potential staff layoffs due to the project is well, that something that this group can answer well i think we have sharon sherry here we can invite her in she might want to address this okay yes she does so let's invite sharon our <laughs> library director if you just want to unmute Hey, everybody. Good morning. Thank you so much for doing this. And, and I really appreciate the question and, and the opportunity to answer it. So first, regarding the branches. Uh, no, absolutely not. They're not going anywhere. They are such a a foundation to library services quality of life in the town of Amherst. Uh, the trustees are absolutely committed to maintaining them. And more importantly, it just so happens that both buildings are owned by the town, the North Amherst Library Building and the Munson Memorial Library Building. And the deeds uh, for both of those buildings require that libraries be maintained in those buildings. Otherwise, the buildings go back to the families, the donor, the original donors. And, and of course, nobody wants that. So um, for all those reasons, no, the branches are totally awesome and safe and we're, we're lucky to be able to have them. Let, um, let, me, let me just sure. jump in there, Sharon, because I, I think that's a really good point. And also that, um, you know, we are, uh, we have an anonymous, anonymous donor who's um, uh, committed to putting an addition and um, making the North Amherst Library accessible and with that investment, it's going to be a, a spectacular new facility that will serve North Amherst with a meeting room, uh, handicap accessible restrooms, plus uh, the uh, with a lift to get up to the historic um, North Amherst Library. So we clearly wouldn't be making that kind of investment if we had any contemplation of, of not keeping the branches open. So thank you, Paul. And so regarding uh, the automated materials handling system, um, you know, upgrading our, our system to using uh, RFID and, and having this book sorter, um, as people are calling it. So, so here we are, we're going to increase the size of the building, we're going to make it accessible and welcoming to everybody and increase and, and usage will increase as a result. It's, it's a documented fact, that's what happens after these library building projects. Um, and so one of the concerns the library trustees have seen all along during these past 10 years that we've been planning for this has been making sure that library operations, once the library is expanded and renovated, making sure that it continues to be affordable. And so one way to do this is by utilizing technology. And, and so actually by using this technology, which is kind of, it's pretty much mainstream for libraries that are being renovated nowadays uh, that circulate a certain amount. And as you all have heard, the Jones Library is the 21st busiest public library in the state of Massachusetts. So having this system is going to help staff manage the increased usage by, by performing tasks that staff don't need to be doing. And instead, it will allow staff to be forward facing, smiles, you know, focusing on the patrons. It's all about the patrons, right? Um, and, and so combine that with the new open floor plan kind of that will be going on, we will, we will not be needing to add staff. So it was all about managing operational expenses, uh, personnel expenses moving forward. Absolutely not. Nobody, no staff member is going to lose their job. Um, yeah, so that's, that's my answer. I've got another one here in the queue that might be relevant to Sharon. I'm not sure if you want to stick around for, for, for one more. Um, this other one asks, how likely is it that the Jones would receive another MBLC grant in the next five years if the one on offer is rejected? So if the town, fabulous question. Um, so if the town votes no on November 2nd, then no. Um, so our, the Jones Library's systems, uh, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, et cetera, the, the atrium, it, it, they're all at the end of life. They're all, it, it's time 
for them to be replaced. And so the next MBLC grant round is not going to happen for another eight to 10 years, give or take. We don't have that kind of time. So we will not be applying for another uh, construction grant through the MBLC. Instead, we would, the trustees would would start back at the beginning. We would write a new building program that, that only involves repairing uh, existing systems and, and staying within our existing footprint. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you, Sharon. I um, will bring you back in if we have more, if you have more to say on library specific questions, we appreciate you being here. Thank you. So we do have some other questions and a couple clarifications, I think, that we got posted from one of the trustees, um, Alex Lefebvre. They say three to seven years until the next grant round would open and two to five years from application to award. So just adding some additional details to sh what Sharon said there. So I have a question here from Jeff. He wants to know, has any consideration been given to developing a long range capital plan that does not require a debt exclusion tax override. So we can model that and we have looked at things like that. It really stretches out. Um, it really stretches out if, if we're committed to doing these four projects, then it really stretches out when the projects can be completed um, or it changes the mix of how much we put towards, towards capital. Right now we're trying to maintain that 10% for capital and do as many of the projects as we can within that 10%. Um, so if we were not going to do debt exclusion, we would have to stretch these out much longer. And the thing that we are really worried about as we go farther into the future and we push things out is that there are other capital needs that aren't even on people's radar right now that are gonna be coming up soon. There's um, high school, middle school or aging buildings. Um, the North Fire Station is an aging building. Um, that's why there is, as Paul mentioned, we've gone several decades without replacing a building. There is urgency to get these buildings done so that we're ready for the next wave of major capital repairs that are coming down the pipe um, in the next 20 or 30 years. Yeah, just to add, to add to that, and the time to do it is now because interest rates are incredibly low. Um, we're, I mean, Sean, what, the last time we did a short-term borrowing was at what percent? Yeah, I mean, we did short-term borrowing at half, I think it was 0.4%. Per, we did a long-term borrowing around a percent. And I agree with you, Paul. I think our biggest challenge right now is time. And mm -hmm. the longer we go without doing one of these projects or getting moving on these projects, the bigger the challenge is. Um, interest rates could rise. The cost of construction will certainly rise. We know that that goes up you know, around 4% per year. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the longer we wait, the more chance that we have that these projects bump up against the next wave of projects. Um, and that causes more difficulties in planning and budgeting. So um, the time is probably our biggest challenge right now and, and we wanna get moving. And I've, I've been in this field long enough to know when interest rates were in the 6% range and that just fundamentally transforms what you can do in terms of uh, within your existing budget. So when we're, you know, again, we're trying to hit while the iron's hot, we've been lucky for many years now about having very low interest rates. And we just had our bond reaffirmed at, at AA, which is a very good uh, interest rate that we will get when we go into the market. So um, I think, we're poised to really take aggressive action on many of these projects. Great, I have a couple more questions here in the queue and more are coming in. Uh, will pursuing the one town, one plan require two debt exclusions? And if Paul, if you don't mind saying what one town, one plan is first and, and then answering, please. Yeah, so when I was hired five years ago, one the, the select board at the time had these four major um, capital projects on the radar screen, uh, and we there a, a sort of a, a plan to move forward on them. And it was to, and one of the goals was to not pit them against each other, not have the library and the schools and the town all sort of vying for the same resident taxpayer money. So we want, we put together a plan where everybody bought in. That the schools, the library, and the town all said yes. This is a plan we can. Everybody was going to get there in get their turn and we we phased it according to when money was available for the capital projects i.e the schools and the library have access to state money which they have secured uh, the town buildings the fire and the dpw do not have access to state money so those were were inserted when we could make them all work together and so we came up with a really creative plan i think 
that draws on uh, a number of factors. It, um, you know, we are, our debt is dropping off to near zero in the next three years. We're going to have vir virtually no long-term debt on our books, uh, which is just unheard of for an enterprise the size of Amherst. Um, and then we've also, as, as Sean started, mentioned, was that we started to elbow room out in our budget to make sure that we were devoting enough in our, from our, the money that we are devoting to our, our ongoing budget for capital. And last year took a bit of a hit because that's how we balanced the budget during the pandemic, but we're moving back up to that 10% of the levy, um, that number. And then at the same time, we've been sort of been very frugal in holding, you know, setting money aside as sort of a, a reserve to smooth out the increases over time. So we knew there was going to be some, some bumps. There's really virtually no way to do all four building projects at this moment at the time in the time frame that we're challenged to do it and uh, without at least one debt exclusion and um, that you know that's that's what we have presented to the both the select board and then to the council and they and it, it's it's pretty compelling evidence I think when you when you look at the numbers that that's necessary. Sean, is there anything you want to add to that? No, only only to just reaffirm that um, the plan only requires one debt exclusion. Um, yeah. We don't need to do two. Great, thank you for that clarification. So I have um, another comment that came in from Alex that I'm gonna read. And then there's a question from, I believe it's Ivana. And I'm sorry if I'm saying that wrong. Um, also, anyone who's newly joined us, please feel free to put your question in the Q&A or raise your hand so we can hear from you live. If you're on a phone, you would press star nine to raise your hand. So Alex added that all current 17 libraries on waiting lists would need to be offered a grant and receive or reject the award before the next round would even be open to apply. The MBLC has estimated that would likely be three to seven years. That's why the timing is uncertain. There are currently 40 libraries waiting to apply for this next round. You don't need to, oh, she said, I don't need to share, but I did. So. <laughs> There you go. Read the whole thing before. <laughs> yeah, you got to lead with do not share. Yeah. <laughs> and Ivana, and again, sorry if I'm saying this wrong. They asked, could be, "What could is be Evan?" Yeah, it could be Evan. It could yes. be Ivana. Very sorry. Either way, what is the future of participatory budgeting in Amherst? So, Paul, you can um, maybe add to mm -hmm. the sort of formal participatory budgeting um, process that the, the committee looked at. Um, I mentioned earlier that we do have some sort of participatory budgeting like processes going on right now. Um, one was this, the Community Preservation Act window, which just wrapped up. Um, so that's no longer available to submit new projects. But um, we did get a lot of interest in CPA this year. There were a lot of projects submitted, um, a lot of good projects from what I can tell so far. Um, and those are all posted on the town's website on, uh, under Community Preservation Act FY23 proposals. Um, so people can go take a look at some of the projects that members of the community have submitted. Um, and then the other thing that I mentioned earlier was that the resident capital request window is open. Um, this is a, uh, any resident in town can submit a capital project, um, which will be reviewed by the town manager. And then that individual will also have the opportunity to present their um, project to the Joint Capital Planning Committee, um, which is a committee in town that reviews the capital plan and makes recommendations to the town manager on the capital plan. So um, not exactly participatory budgeting, but um, two, two processes we have where the public can submit funding requests. Yeah, so, so the charter called for a participatory budgeting commission, which did meet from the beginning of the charter and they concluded their work uh, this summer. There's some interruption due to the, the pandemic, um, but they've delivered a report to the council and, and made a presentation to the council about participatory budgeting. I think their conclusion was pretty much that given the constraints of the budget, setting aside a sum of money, a significant sum of money like uh, some communities do, i.e. city of Cambridge, was not within the um, realm of the town of Amherst, but they really did in, uh, encourage um, more participation in the budget making process, which is why we've done the resident capital requests. Um, we will have a public forum on the budget before um, uh, priorities are set in November. Uh, we'll have a, there'll be a public, we'll do a, a major presentation on financial indicators, which we look back at 10 years and look at projection of 10 years worth of data on our budget. And then we ask people to weigh in on things and their priorities. And there's lots of ways to, to log in. You know, we've said, you know, Brianna really has set up this Engage Amherst um, 
website where lots of different projects are there. And it's a way for people to, if you have a question, you can pose it there and it stays there. We, we have a designated staff person who will answer it and then it stays there. So you can sort of see a menu of all the questions that have been posed. It's not like, um, you know, it gets answer, asked once and then nobody sees it again. And there's also places for people just to comment, weigh in. And, you know, like we talked about the Hickory Ridge thing being there and we've got, I think up there of 40, 50 people who've already weighed in on things. So that will be the case with the budget as well. And we tried to give as many sort of entry points for people through either through CPA or um, the operating budget or capital budget as we can, as early as we can. And, but all along the way, we're, we're readily accessible. If you have an idea, just email us or, t or talk to one of your counselors or something like that. Um, it's a small town and it's good to, to advance them. Well, can I add one more um, that Brianna talked a little bit about already, which is um, we presented our first spending plan for American Rescue Act funds, mm -hmm. um, which is a, a grant related to COVID from the federal government. Um, the town is receiving about $12 million. And so we did a first proposal to the council on Monday night, and now we're in a community engagement phase for the month of October. Um, there are a number of um, engagement sessions coming up. I think the first one's on the 13th, it's on the calendar, um, where people can weigh in and let us know if they like the plan, don't like the plan, have other ideas. Um, there's also, as Brianna mentioned earlier, there's gonna be a survey that is gonna be put out there where um, you can provide feedback that way and also again, submit um, alternative ideas. And so as Paul said, we're really trying to interact as much as we can um, on these different opportunities. We've got a question here from Anna. Um, Anna says, hi all, thanks for doing this, hugely helpful. What is the best way for residents to estimate project costs mm -hmm. when submitting capital requests, especially for those who aren't mm -hmm. familiar with municipal budgeting? Mm -hmm. It's a very good question. Yeah, it's a really good question. Yeah, so um, it kind of depends on what it is. So um, uh, one option I've seen people do in the past is call a contractor uh, or whoever, somebody in the field who is related to the um, to the project being requested and just ask them for a rough estimate of what they think it would cost. Um, that would be sort of like, I think maybe what I would propose to do first. Um, if that's not an option, um, you could certainly reach out to staff and we could try to point you in the right direction as to how to estimate that. Um, worst case scenario, maybe you submit it with with no budget there, you just submit the project idea, then we work with you. Um, but I would start by trying to talk to somebody who's an expert in the field to get an estimate. And if not, then reach out to staff and we'll try to um, support that. Yeah, I think it's, you know, that's a, it's a good question, because it's really hard for people in the general public to say, I would like a playground at, on the South Amherst Common, right? I have no idea what that would cost. And, but we can give some reference points. We know what the one at Kendrick Park cost. We can say it'll be in this range. We can provide some guidance to that end. And it's not a be all end all number. It's to, it's, it's to encourage people to put things in with a rough, rough idea um, of what it might cost. It's, that's not gonna be the actual final number most likely because we'll have to get more, obviously get in more details than a, than a resident would be able to do. If someone's saying they'd like, you know, uh, solar on top of all of our buildings or something like that, we'd say, okay, we can help sort of gauge what that number might be, what the range is. So I don't think, I would say, don't get hung up on what the number is and don't, you know, kill yourself because public procurement mm -hmm. <laughs> and in the public sector is just a lot different than, um, than what you might do at your own home. So I was just about to invite our council president and your district two counselor, Lynn Griesmer, to come in the room, but her hand is raised, so she beat me to it. So I am going to invite Lynn in, if you could unmute. Welcome, I, Lynn. I pressed the wrong button, <laughs> but thank you. Um, I want to add another point on the library, and that is that the council in looking at this issue very closely, and I have to say over a period of two years, um, also asked for the library to obtain an estimate of what all of the repairs would cost uh, if we were going to just repair the library. And ultimately, between fixing all of the, or re replacing all of the existing systems, of doing things such as replacing carpeting, et cetera, and making it handicap accessible, we end up with an amount of money that's about equal to the same amount of money that the town will pay 
toward the library. That of course is complemented by the fundraising of the Jones Library trustees and friends, and it's complemented by a very sizable grant from the state through the Mass Board of Library Commissioners. So the real choice is, do you want the existing library with the same facade that will be there even if we renovate it, the same building will be there even if we mm -hmm. renovate it? Do you want that or do you want a modern library? Uh, and at either one is at the same cost. And so uh, this is an issue I personally struggled with. And after spending the two years that I did getting to know the issue, it's public information. I voted in favor of accepting the MBLC grant. So um, there you have my opinion. <laughs> yeah, and, and just building off of what Lynn said, we had our, um... We had our financial advisor model those two different scenarios, um, whether we do take the MBLC grant money um, or do the, there was a couple different repair options or different phasings. Um, and we had our financial advisor take that with the different interest rates that, um, that they project and model it. Um, and the cost did come out very similar regardless of what option we chose. Thank you for adding that point, Lynn. Any, anything else you wanna share? We've got about, 20 community members in the room right now. No, I look forward to touring Hickory Ridge myself. I'm planning to do that this afternoon. And um, I also really, really encourage people to use the website Engage Amherst. And Paul, close your ears, because we'll also have a thing on the website soon, uh, inviting people to comment on the town managers regarding his annual evaluation. So I'll be using you. that. I'll be using that a lot. I'll be filling out a hundred of those. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, teasing. I know. Thank so, you. But, but Lynn, if, if we see you this afternoon, make sure you wear boots. It does get a little damp out there. I have to say. Uh, kind of like when we went to see the farm the other day. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> we'll see you this afternoon, Lynn. Thank you. Okay, so for anyone who's joined, we, oh, we've got a new question in the room. I just was going to encourage you to pop your questions into the Q&A or raise your hand um, to share a question or comment with us. Could We have a, a question here. Could Sharon discuss what would happen to the special collections if the MBLC grant is rejected? Uh, so if Sharon's still in the room, if you mm -hmm. are and able to answer, there she is. Okay, if you could just unmute. You are. Howdy, sure. So uh, can you repeat the question again? If the MBLC, repeat the yes. question again. Yes, so what would happen to the special collections if the MBLC grant is rejected? Okay, um, yeah, so no matter what, if the entire project is voted down, um, the trustees will start over and go through the JCPC process. Um, we would have to establish another feasibility committee, write another building program. Um, we would go to JCPC. That would be for next year process because we're missing it for this year, I think. Um, and we would ask money to hire an architect and an OPM and you know, kind of start the process over again. Anyway, so a part of that would be, what do we do with special collect collections within the existing footprint of the building? And, and I, have, I, I don't have the answer to that, but with, by, by remaining in our footprint, and if there are other things that we need to do, for example, add a teen space, it would mean other spaces would have to get smaller. Um, so I don't know how the needs of special collections and ESL, uh, uh, how those would fall into place. And let me just frame out what, when um, Sharon talks about JCPC process that to people not in, you know, that's how we talk about it. It's really our capital planning process. The Joint Capital Planning Committee has representatives from the town, the school department, the school committee, and the um, Board of Library Trustees. And that's where all the capital projects go and they get reviewed and as a group again. So we're sort of talking to each other and sort of prioritizing all projects on equal footing instead of um, different groups trying to advocate independently for their projects. So that's, that's a, we have a relatively formalized process for considering capital requests and they all 
get funneled through this one single process and we look at how much money we have available and what we're gonna spend it on. Great, and hopefully that answered your question that um, whoever posted that, if not, feel free to post a clarifying question or comment. Thank you, Sharon, for that. Okay, so I don't see any hands or questions in the queue currently. Are there things, um, Paul and Sean, that you wanted to share that you hadn't got asked? I know we've had a lot of great questions already, but are there um, some points or facts about the process or anything else that's going on that you wanna share while we wait for some more questions? Hmm. I want, to, I want to congratulate Sean on being the new father. It's number three for you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> Why he's tired today. <laughs> no, I'll just remind people that um, there is a, as we talked about earlier, there was an engage page on ARPA. There's an engage page on engage Amherst page on Hickory Ridge. There was also an engage, one of the earlier ones, um, there was an Engage Amherst page set up on these four building projects and the and the plan. And so if anybody um, wants to kind of fr freshen up on uh, what that plan is and all the resources related to it, um, you can go to that Engage Amherst and find it. I think it's called Financing Our Future is what we named uh, that project page. It's got the the presentation of finance committee, which really lays out in more detail the plan to fund the four building projects and the different um, cautions and the different um, strategies and all the, you know, we try to really do a full comprehensive presentation on that. Um, and then there's also links to the Q and A's that have been out there and some videos. So um, there's a lot of good information on that Engage Amherst page on, that includes this library project. So and I'd like to shift gears a little bit uh, and talk about COVID, you know, like we have, a lot of new developments coming up um, and if, if they haven't been announced, announced they will be soon. So um, there are different strategies when we're addressing uh, um, COVID-19. Uh, our numbers are going down. There was the spike um, during the Delta variant that we all witnessed and uh, that has pretty much tapered off at both the university and at, uh, in the community numbers. Um, we have just uh, formed a partnership with the university to provide community testing in, in the town. Um, they've always provided community testing, but you had to go on campus to get the testing. And many of our uh, members of our community were hesitant to do that. And it was sort of inconvenient. So now we have a, um, you can pick up a test starting on Tuesday at the Board of Health, at the Health Department in the Banks Community Center. It'll be a little baggy with all the things you need in it. You can go to your car, do the test or take it home with you at your convenience. And then you can drop it in a drop box that we have at the Banks Community Center. Um, that will get picked up every day at 9.30 and taken over to the university for processing. And within certainly within 24 hours, hopefully uh, during the week, you'll get your results back. So that's gonna be a, a free, easy way to get tested for COVID-19. That's a great new partnership with the university. Um, and then for, for vaccinations, which is another important tool for us, um, we are having vaccination clinics every Thursday afternoon, I think from four to six it is, it's on, I believe it's on our website. Um, and we're also continuing with our vaccination program um, at, um, for the homebound uh, and for first responders um, and working with the schools. I think they're preparing for um, vac a vaccination program at the schools when that uh, but the, when that those uh, tests th those vaccines get approved for younger st students, um, this will include the booster. Um, when that gets when that when that gets we get the um, supply. Right now, it's a, it's kind of a supply issue uh, for the Pfizer, um, but as soon as we get it and have adequate dosages, we will be publicizing that so we can you'll be able to get your booster shot if that's what you're looking for. Um, if you haven't been vaccinated, that's readily available right now. Um, for all three different um, things. Um, and then, so th those are the two, the two big things is getting tested and the vaccine. Thanks, Paul. And just so everyone's aware, this information will be all on our COVID website, the information regarding the test sites and the procedures and how to access everything um, is being kind of worked out and will be posted there. If you have any questions, you can mm -hmm. call the COVID concerns line um, or email us. Is it okay to go back to the library? We have a couple sure. more questions that came in to the queue. So 
Okay, we've got a couple questions that are coming in. Thank you. So does the library project endanger funding for a new elementary school? We've heard this before. Who wants to yeah. take that one? So, so I would say no. I mean, that's exactly why we developed a plan to do all four. Um, the schools in particular are really on their own track with the MSBA and, and the debt exclusion vote. They um, they were first in the queue back in 2015, 2016. And now, you know, now they're still in that MSBA queue again, and they're following along that MSBA um, path. And so they're on a debt exclusion vote. So the funding that will go for that project is different than the funding that's going for the library, the fire station, the DPW. Um, the funding for the library, DPW and fire station is coming out of our existing capital funds that we allocate each year. So um, we have, that's why we came up with this one plan um, specifically not to pit these against each other. Thank you, Sean. And Kent wants us to please clarify that if the library project is turned down in favor of a repair of the present building, none of the outside sources of funding available for the project would be available for these repairs. Um, so more or less the town uh, would be paying the entire cost for the repair if, if that's the way things go. Do either of you wanna add anything to that? Uh, only that that's how we modeled it. So when we talked about the cost being roughly the same between the MBLC project and the repair project, um, for the repair project, we assumed there was no additional funding um, outside of um, outside of the town funding. So, and, and just to reference what Mr. Johnson said earlier in the in the um, session here, um, you know, it's it's much much easier to go out and ask people to support a new a new building project than it is to say, would you be willing to donate money for a maintenance contract for the elevator system or something like that? So I think that that, you know, that, that's the reference point that they, the trustees have committed to raising um, multiple millions of dollars for this project. And they've already, they're well on their way to making that happen. Um, so th there is a significant private fundraising component to this project um, that, will really show the community support for it, I think. And, and the one thing I'd add to that, Paul, too, when we talk about deferred maintenance, there's sort of um, like two buckets of def deferred maintenance. There's sort of just the repairs that maybe didn't get done over the years. And then there's things like building code changes that are mm -hmm. you know, some of the big ticket items in the, um, in the repair project are things that are more related to the building was built I don't know, 20 or 30 or 40, however, whenever we did the renovation years ago, and now the code has changed and there's things we have to do differently that cost more money. Um, and we sort of lump it all into this bucket of deferred maintenance, but um, they're a little bit different. All right, we've got a, a comment and a question from Michelle. Uh, one of our shared goals is to beef up our equity lens and ensure that our capital projects serve all community members. How will the town, including the library building project committee, work to include black indigenous people of color and other marginalized voices in the next phase of planning for the library and for future capital projects? So I'll start with that and Sean, you can jump in. So that's a really good point, Michelle. And we're actually looking at things through sort of two lenses. One is the sustainability lens and the other is racial equity um, lens. And so for all of our expenditures and all of our um, capital planning, those are the two things that we're sort of, um, the council has articulated that as a high goal and that's how we're building our budgets uh, through those two lenses. Uh, for the library project in particular, there are two seats um, that are available, that are community seats that are on the committee, on the Jones Library Building Committee that we are seeking to um, fill. Uh, interviewing some folks today and um, hopefully hopefully we'll find some people who, who um, will represent large numbers of group of people. And um, I think there's gonna be a lot of other ways um, for people to be engaged as, as this plan goes forward. And Paul, the one thing I would add to that too is um, we recently established a diversity, equity and inclusion um, coordinator. And then we're looking to fill a, a, another position that these positions once they're filled will bring that lens to everything we do, um, or we'll magnify that lens with everything we do. And so I'm sure they will play a role um, with our outreach efforts and um, the feedback that we get. I'm really glad Sharon raised her hand because I know the library have, has done a lot of work in this area. Oh, hi, everybody. So, <laughs> so this question is terrifying um, to me and, and which is why I have to answer it. Um, so I, l let me start with, over the summer, a fellow Amherst employee told me that members of our community don't feel welcome coming into the Jones Library because they feel it's a white space. 
And so I've been spending a lot of time thinking about this, a really lot of time thinking about this. The library system's mission has always been to provide buildings and programs and services that are open to everyone in the community. But if members of the community are not comfortable coming into our buildings or taking part in our programs and services, that we are not meeting our mission. And to my knowledge, the library has never had this conversation and it's time we do. Um, one of the goals of the expansion renovation project is to make the Jones Building welcoming to all. Um, I am one member of the Jones Library Building Committee and I will be advocating for a community outreach process that decenters whiteness. Um, I envision a design development process which is evaluating all the spaces in the building in terms of inclusivity. Our, our square footage is set, the budget is set, but so many other decisions still have to be made. Um, and I am, I'm ready to listen. I'm excited to see the results of this project um, and this process. And again, I, I'm, I'm absolutely ready to listen. Thank you for asking the question. Thank you so much, Sharon. We appreciate your response there. Okay, we are getting close to our hour. We do have some time left. I'd love to invite any last questions or uh, raised hands. I do see Thomas. So Thomas, why don't you come on in and unmute yourself? Thanks. Um, just to follow up on what Sharon just said. Um, research shows that um, in many communities, as diversity increases, um, there can be negative effects. Uh, interpersonal trust can decline, social capital can decline. Um, and such communities have to be proactive in, in, you know, some people would call it social engineering to, to mitigate those, those impacts. And institutions like the public library are central to that. So I'm glad to hear Sharon mentioning her efforts. But I'll state the obvious, and 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 that is that aside from, the, you know, the features of the new building, as important as they will be, it's the type of programming that's offered by libraries which is most important. I'll leave it at that. Hopefully this will be an ongoing discussion because it's critical. I, I would not feel good about supporting uh, the expansion of the library without uh, proactive efforts to increase its use by our diverse community. I also just wanted to add that, um, you know, when, when, when libraries are um, supported initially uh, by donors like the Jones, like the Forbes, like the CLAP, you know, many libraries. In many cases, the original donors not only provide for the capital expense of the construction and so on, or the book collection, but they also provide for an endowment, a long-term endowment. I don't know if that was the case of the Jones. I think it might've been for the Forbes, but I do hope that uh, as the um, trustees um, do fundraising for, for or you know, now for the expansion and so on, that they do talk to potential donors about also contributing to an endowment. It's it's not unusual. It's a it's 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 actually can be very useful. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. And and the, and the library does have an endowment. Sharon or Sean, do you want to talk about that? Sharon. Am I still unmuted? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, yes, we do have an endowment. Um, the value, gosh, the, it, it, it's the highest it's ever been. Um, it, it's breaking on 10 million. Um, and we do take a 4% draw from that every year. Um, and uh, let me go back a little bit, Thomas, to... Um, I appreciate your comments about programming. You're absolutely right. Um, I and staff staff are working on that. Um, so not only programs, but also 
so the art that we hang on our walls, the displays, the book displays that we're, that we're uh, showing as people enter the building. Um, you know, we used to have that big painting that it was the first thing people would see of a wealthy white man in the beautiful red robes. And, and that is no longer the first thing people see when they enter the building. And, and so, so I don't know what the building would look like because th this is the part where I need to stop and listen. And, and, and this is why the community engagement process is so important. I just want to sit down with people, you know, genuine people who absolutely want to want to give opinions and, and feedback. And, and I want to listen to that and make it happen. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sharon. All right, so we are, I'm just gonna do a quick check. I don't see any hands raised. Uh, I don't see any more questions in the queue. This is being recorded and we will put it up online shortly for anybody who wants to share it with friends. Um, if you have questions that you didn't feel comfortable asking or didn't get a chance to ask, feel free to email us at info at amherstandmay.gov. But before we wrap up, I wanna give um, our guests and Paul uh, a ch last chance to to leave some words with the community members. Sean, Sean anything? Sure. Um, thank you for coming. And uh, we're, you know, we're going into really kick off our budget season very soon. So um, don't hesitate to either send your input to the council, the town manager, you can send it to me. Um, we have a budget um, uh, forum coming up soon after the financial indicators meeting. Um, so definitely get involved and, and share your feedback with us. So I just, yeah, I support what Sean said, you know, the, the uh, financial indicators uh, is interesting to us, maybe not be interesting to everybody, but it's, just, it's a lot of really detailed information that's November 15th scheduled for right now. Um, and I do, I, I, like Brianna, thanks for putting this together. It's, it was so gratifying to see so many people here today, and we can't wait to get back to when we could do it in person, and make it a little bit more, less formal. Um, that's the value of this this interaction is where you can be sitting at a table having coffee and people can ask their own individual questions. So, um, so that'll be fun when we get to get there and we will eventually, I'm sure. And I will just say if anyone needs help navigating some of the resources, the meetings, the websites, we mentioned a lot of those today, please reach out. Again, you can reach out to me directly or send us a quick email at info at amherstma.gov and I can get you connected to um, anything that we mentioned and more uh, today. So I want to thank everybody for joining us. I want to thank Sean and Paul and uh, we will see you next time. Thanks everybody. Bye everybody.